Hi, I'm Jesse Stubble, and I'm here to talk to you about virtual learning communities. There is a consensus in the literature about the benefits of a student's sense of belonging. Researchers suggest that higher levels of belonging lead to increases in GPA, academic achievement, and motivation. There is no one-size-fits-all set of best practices for building a learning community, whether on ground or online. We have to start by looking to our own existing communities for expertise. Who at our institutions is already doing this work and doing it well? And who has figured out how to do it effectively online? How can we better support those efforts? And we have to start by finding out who our students are, what they need to be successful, and how our institutional mission does and sometimes doesn't align with our practices. We need to design our pedagogical approaches for the students we have, not the students we wish we had. This is not a theoretical exercise, it is a practical one. Kathy Davidson has argued that you cannot counter structural inequality with goodwill. You have to structure equality. Inclusivity on a college campus starts with small human acts. Walk campus to assess accessibility of common spaces and classrooms. Accessible desks in every classroom don't do much good if students can't get to them because the rooms are overcrowded. Invite students to share their pronouns, model this behavior, but don't expect it of everyone. Not all students will feel equally safe sharing pronouns. Make sure there is an easy and advertised process for students, faculty, and staff to change their names in institutional systems. Be sure chosen names are what appear on course rosters and ID cards. Regularly invite campus community into hard conversations about inclusivity. For example, frank discussion of gender and race bias in grading and course evaluations. What does it look like to do this kind of inclusivity work online? How do we walk our virtual campuses to address accessibility concerns? Where do we hold the necessary town hall meetings to address hard questions about inclusivity? It's going to be different at each institution. It's going to be different for each group of students, each group of faculty. What we have to do is look at our own campuses and look at our environments and figure out what steps we need to take at our institutions. We can learn a lot from each other, but we have to start by looking internally and asking the people who are living every day on our campus, where are the barriers? Educational campuses have libraries, coffee shops, cafeterias, quads, lawns, amphitheaters, stadiums, hallways, student lounges, trees, park benches, and fountains. Ample space for rallies, study groups, conversation, debate, student clubs, and special events. Few institutions pay much attention to recreating these spaces online. The work done outside and between classes, which is the glue that holds education together, is attended to nominally, if at all. Some learning happens best in rooms with walls, but some learning happens best in fields or in libraries or in town squares. How to build an online learning community. I've gathered together six theses here. I'm going to talk about a few of those theses and explore them with a little bit more depth. You can find the rest of these online. I've shared them in the slides for this talk. Online learning communities need to be hybrid communities. Many students face very specific challenges at home, housing insecurity, domestic violence, lack of access to internet or other technology, physical disability, chronic and acute illness. We can't assume all students or staff can simply join our communities from home. We have to build with an understanding of these challenges and even where learning remains fully or mostly online, we have to continue to make space on college campuses for students who have no other homes from which to shelter in place. According to the Hope Center's National Real College Survey, out of 86,000 students surveyed, 56% were housing insecure in the previous year, and 17% were homeless. LGBTQ young adults had 120% higher risk of reporting homelessness compared to youth who identified as heterosexual and cisgender. I think to some degree all of our work is already hybrid. We're already moving back and forth between digital and physical spaces. What we're not doing is thinking intentionally about where the roadblocks are or thinking intentionally about moments where intersections happen. Online learning communities don't require video, synchronous meetings, formal expectations, or extrinsic motivators. In fact, these can frustrate efforts at creating presence and a sense of belonging. 
Not all students, faculty, and staff will be able to meet synchronously, and different students learn in different ways at different times. Staring directly into the faces of 20 other people compelled to engage via video from within their own homes, and sometimes their bedrooms, doesn't reproduce or even simulate the kinds of academic and informal gatherings that happen on a college campus. There's something that happens at the end of a class when you've been with students face to face for 50 minutes and class releases and people sort of hover for minutes sometimes, waiting to talk, engaging with one another, having side conversations, having these moments where they really genuinely see one another. Those are the places where students can ask teachers hard questions. Those are the spaces where students make relationships with one another. In a synchronous video Zoom chat, you have all of the formality of the engagement and all of the formality of what we do in institutions of education, but you don't have that moment of pause, that moment where people just hover and figure out and see who each other is. What we need to do is put all of our energy into trying to recreate those moments, and those don't, moments don't happen in a little neat and tidy box inside of Zoom. Our ability to develop community will depend on our willingness to acknowledge trauma that members of our community have and will experience. There is robust evidence that social isolation and loneliness significantly increase risk for premature mortality, and the magnitude of the risk exceeds that of many leading health indicators. Our ability to develop community will depend on our willingness to continue feeling joy, having epiphanies, asking hard questions, and sharing our curiosity with one another. Bell Hooks writes in Teaching to Transgress, as a classroom community, our capacity to generate excitement is deeply affected by our interest in one another, in hearing one another's voices, in recognizing one another's presence. In short, to create a sense of belonging, we need to build a community of care, ask genuine open-ended questions, wait for answers, let conversation wander, model what it looks like to be wrong and to acknowledge when we're wrong. Recognize that the right to speak isn't distributed equally. Make our listening visible. Listening looks different online, especially when we engage asynchronously. In a discussion forum, much of our listening becomes invisible, but even in a video conferencing tool like Zoom, listening looks different. In an on-ground discussion, we might viscerally feel the hum of a room, listening for intake of breath and watching for people leaning forward at the edge of speech. How do we create adequate space for contribution online? How do we reckon with the fact that silence online can often feel a whole lot more silent? If there's one thing that I think that we can do, it's to start by trusting students. Listen for their voices. We do a lot of measurement in higher education, qualitative, quantitative, uh, it's pretty rare that we just ask students how and when they learn. I think what we need to do is we need to just ask them, and we need to believe their answers. I think that's where this work starts. Thank you.